Very good morning. It's a great pleasure for me to be among you on behalf of the Latin American Pediatric Palliative Care Community. But I can't start speaking about pediatric palliative care in Latin America without telling you that among us, there is one of the first teachers and also one of the first persons developing pediatric palliative care services in the region, Dr. Lisbeth Quesada Tristan. And I would like uh, to ask you to give a big round of applause for her. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Lisbeth, for all you have done, taught, and continue doing in Costa Rica and Latin America for the well-being of so many children and families. And uh, regarding the, the questions that you already asked us at first, and despite being aware of still the long way to go in Latin America in order to achieve an universal and equitable access to pediatric palliative care, I'm very pleased and proud to say that an increasing enthusiastic and committed community of pediatric palliative care professionals is emerging in the region. And as for the concrete, Pediatric palliative care development, um, I can say that most of the countries in the region have at least one service um, or one initiative going in on. The good news is that almost everywhere the pediatric palliative care services are part of and are integrated into the national health service programs. But the bad news is that most of the countries, in most of the countries, the pediatric palliative care services are only assisted limited populations, with big differences regarding the conditions uh, that the um, children are, some services for children with cancer, another with non-cancer conditions, some are in, developed in in the public system, others in the private, but not in a regular way. And there are also um, great differences among the integration of uh, the professional integration of the teens and a very heterogeneous training of the professionals integrated that teams. Uh, I, I can say that uh, perhaps Costa Rica in Central America is the only country that delivers universal pediatric palliative care assistance for all children in need. And as to the challenges and projects that are being or have been performed, uh, I would like to share with you that uh, within the Latin American Association of Palliative Care, there is a pediatric commission that has been very active during pandemic and it's currently active and is one of the high meeting points for the professionals of the region. Another um, um, important project I have to, I, I have the pleasure to highlight is the EPEC uh, Pediatric Latin American Group. In 2013, a group of Latin American professionals um, under the coordination of Veronica Dussel from Argentina and with the help of, uh, of Stefan Fritisdorf, um, took um, uh, the, um, the, the work of um, adapting and translating into Spanish the, the original EPEC uh, pediatric course. And um, since 2015, this um, version, the Spanish version of EPEC, has been presented uh, three times in different countries, uh, in person, and in last year in the Trans-Pacific Virtual Course. And um, nowadays, a, a partnership with a Pan American Health Organization and Seth Schutz, a virtual format of uh, EPEC Pediatric for Latin America is carrying on. Another important project uh, is the ECO project that is, uh, there is an Amer a Latin American brand from the ECO uh, project from Albuquerque, US, 
and they consist on a periodical online meetings of the pediatric palliative care community, and this has been running since 2016 in Uruguay and since 2021 in Argentina. And um, the other things I would like to highlight is that since 2021, a pediatric palliative care Latin American research team has been working on an honorary basis and at present the main objectives are to define the best way to identify the pediatric palliative care needs of the region. Regarding education, many basic educational uh, initiatives are developed by local uh, scientific societies, particularly pediatric uh, national societies. But when considering courses uh, for training pediatric palliative care specialists, there are still only a few. Uh, since 2015, Argentina has a a specialist title, a title for pediatric palliative care. Uruguay has just started a one-year uh, interdisciplinary uh, pediatric palliative care diploma, and Costa Rica and Mexico are about to approve and start pediatric palliative care specialist uh, courses. And regarding the, the critical issues and challenges that may re require and may um, be helped by uh, global efforts. I, I would like to, to highlight that the main issue uh, for the development in, of pediatric palliative care in Latin America are the great inequities in terms of access and in terms of quality of care within and among countries. The second important issue are the scarcity of advanced learning opportunities, as I have already said, and it would be helpful to share international ones, international opportunities. Some of you have already uh, said it before, but I, I would like to highlight the importance of uh, being creative and innovative, as I, we already learned in this conference, and to use technology in order to um, include interpreters to different languages, who, who, what would uh, make easier for um, professionals from uh, other countries um, not being very comfortable with English. And besides, there are few or no there are few or no research opportunities in the region. Most of the research and publishing initiatives are without a specific budget. We really admire a common database like Share Project in the U.S. and a similar one would be necessary and very helpful in Latin America, but impossible with uh, without a budget. So, collaborative global research initiatives would be very really very welcome. And last, and of the greatest importance, I would like to emphasize the huge inequities to access to pain medication and other medication in some countries of the region. There are still some countries in Latin America that do not have universal access to morphine. And in addition to that, in countries with a better accessibility like mine, there is almost total lack of child-friendly presentations of pain relief medications. We know that this is a consequence of pharmaceutical industry decisions. But being pain control a human right, we claim and demand that adequate presentations of pain relief medications for children must be available at any region in the world, despite not being profitable for the industry. This is perhaps one of the main problems that need a global visibility, and I do hope that this committed pediatric palliative care community take this message and help us about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mercedes. And I would like to join with you in saying it's a real honor and pleasure to have Lisbeth here with us. 
The very first standards of children's palliative care that I ever used were those that you developed. So thank you. And thank you, Mercedes. I think there's so many commonalities coming through and highlighting again the inequities, the lack of access, the lack of access to medications, that we need to come together stronger as, an, as a global group and to have our voices heard to help all countries. So thank you for that. Now we're going to have... Um, Videos from two people who unfortunately couldn't be here with us today. And so first of all is Dr. Miriam Mukaden, a previous um, chair of the International Children's Palliative Care Network and a leader in pediatric palliative care in, in India. So I wonder if we could just have that, um, that first video, please. Thanks, Trudeau. Okay, ma'am, you can start. I'm really privileged to be talking to you all today through a video recording regarding the progress of children's palliative care in India. Thank you to the Barutsa Foundation for having given me this opportunity to present to you some of the work which is happening. So let's start with the history which started for me in 2002 when after training from Cardiff University, I came back as a radiation oncologist to start the children's palliative care for cancer cases because there were quite a few children who had relapsed or recurrent disease and needed children's palliative care. So my, my teachers from Cardiff and other people from all over the world, including the ICPCN, the Marutsa, the EPIC group, we all, we all became friends, we all got together to promote children's palliative care all over the world. And with the help of ICPCN, the DFID project from the UK started in the year 2010. It was a five-year project in which we created three centers. <clears throat> One was an urban center, which was basically for HIV patients at our Sign Hospital. The second one was a rural project as a community-based project through the collaboration with the National Rural Health Mission. <clears throat> and the last and third one was a semi-urban project. While this was going on for us for the five years, there were other centers also doing really good work in Delhi, Kerala, Hyderabad, and many other centers where along with what we were doing, we had started work in non-cancer, children's palliative care. At the end of five years, and I will be presenting the results of all that we have been doing up to date. At the end of the five years, we got two projects. One was through an organization called BKT, where we set up sites at Aurangabad and Goa. And now we are trying to include a third site, possibly in a city called Jaipur. And similarly, we got, pro we were very fortunate to be chosen by the CIPLA Foundation to set up five projects for pediatric palliative care in the city itself. So we have done at Rajiv Gandhi Medical Colleges, uh, uh, Medical College almost 800 children in the last three years, all of them non-cancer conditions. Similarly, at the Topiwala National Medical College, where we have in record, uh, re enrolled in the the last one and a half years, about 300 children. And we have just started neonatal palliative care at the KEM hospital. And at the end of our three years, we plan to have another two. So what has happened since the, we started in 2002, we st since we started with cancer at the Tata Memorial Hospital, we have enrolled about a thousand children. And we have continued to help them with the holistic care, which is expected through children's palliative care. And I'm really happy to announce that in those two years of the pandemic, we were able to care for those children and families who could not attend the Tata Hospital through daily consultations. And it was so successful that we have now done a research project. And the, re the results of that project will be coming out as a publication very shortly. In the other projects I talked to you about, those seven or eight projects, we have enrolled more than 5,000 children since the year 2010. In the other centers all over the 
uh, country, I will be giving you some of their statistics, which are very similar. Because of these projects, because of the experience which we gained, we were able to not only do service, but we were able to do teaching for doctors, nurses, social workers, counselors about the basic principles. And this has been going on now for the last almost 20 years. Because of this project, especially the different project, we were able to have policies on palliative care and children's palliative care, both at the center and the states. That's how it works in India, that we have health is, uh, is a state subject, but there is also in something which needs to be done at the center. We have also initiated a lot of research protocols, measuring quality of life, measuring family situations, and we also have done three qualitative protocols. And with, with this that we have been doing since the last 2002, I think we have about five projects which are running in Maharashtra at this time and is expanding pretty rapidly, not only in Maharashtra, but in other parts of the country as well. So let me tell you a little bit about what's happening at some of our sister organizations. One of the really important ones which came up is Kerala and Telangana. So in Telangana, they also have a palliative care policy. And at every district, wherever the palliative care has been set up, there is also teaching being done for pediatric palliative care. And they are hoping that with this teaching, which is ongoing, that they will be able to set up those children's palliative care centers at every district. At the present moment, all the districts feel that when they need the help on, and support of the pediatric palliative care, that they can call up to the tertiary center and they get advice over the phone. In Kerala, the policy for palliative care was introduced in 2009. And in every primary health care center, there is a trained nurse. And these nurses can reach out to the pediatric palliative care centers as well. The first center was started in 2004, and then in 2010, there was another center in a place called Trivandra. Through these centers and many more which have also been started, there have been training for pediatricians all through the state, including the three zonal conferences. All the districts have been trained, some, of the, some government colleges, some private hospitals, and the policy of a pain-free hospital initiative was started in 2018, and now they it is claimed that all these hospitals, especially for children, are pain-free. <clears throat> there has also been adequate training for all the pediatricians in the government medical colleges. And all, there has also been a thrust on the morphine availability, which is there in Kerala, as well as in Maharashtra, and probably in Telangana as well, in most of the districts. So that for, for that pain-free situation, there is enough of medicines available. Interestingly, in another state of ours called Tamil Nadu, this children's palliative care organized, uh, initiative was taken not by the doctors, but by a group of volunteers known as Golden Butterflies. And they work very closely with many hospitals along with the doctors and the nurses. And they are also committed now to start some training and research. And similar efforts are going on in West Bengal, well, that we have many states in our country and there are efforts happening in most of the other states as well. So the outcome of this whole initiative of children's palliative care in the country has also led to some initiatives which have been taken up by the government. One of them being the Rashtra Bal Seva Karikram, or the RBSK for short, where there is funding available for children, similar to the another, uh, another scheme known as the Integrated Child Protection Scheme, where if the child is declared as chronic palliative care, then they, there is money paid into their bank accounts every month. And this really helps the family to be able to provide the best possible care for these children. In the realm of teaching, we have got three one-year fellowships all over the country, and we also have many small programs which are going on. Almost it's been eight years, I think, where we have been trying to integrate our children's palliative care training into the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And finally, last year during the pandemic, it actually started. And we have trained more than 200 pediatricians in two basic courses. And the advanced course is going to start in 2030. Uh, because, along with training, we have published quite a few research papers, quantitative, uh, quality of life, qualitative, and this 
pediatric uh, the palliative care policy for the for the country actually initiated especially in maharashtra through the children's palliative care so it's a way of actually showing how the pediatric options have helped in creating policies for the country well as in any other program there are always difficulties there are challenges and some of the issues we face are the pediatricians and the families the parents the the rest of the uh, kin will not are not ready to accept that you know it's time to give up curative options and maybe it's time to look at a holistic care for our children so we have we it's it's a very difficult struggle it's an uphill battle but i think that because of we have, since we have been doing this in 2002 i think we have made mom in roles it's difficult to for the pediatricians to think that palliative care can be for non cancer which is a fact in pediatrics much more than in adults and therefore they have to be convinced a lot there is a big issue of opioid availability especially for those children who are registered in hospitals who do not treat cancer and also of course we have been struggling with the pediatricians but thanks to sipla foundation and some of our senior pediatricians as i told you earlier we have managed to introduce the curriculum into the indian academy of pediatrics and hopefully we'll be able to introduce it into the mba of pediatrics very soon well uh, just to end i think i would like to emphasize the fact that with this uh, with this experience that many of our workforce has had over the last 20 years we have been able to give the children and their families quite an amount of normalcy and this itself gives us a fulfillment and a prolonged motivation to continue with the work we have been able to teach many of the nurses social workers counselors about principles of palliative care in multi professional teams and that also has been very rewarding uh, as i said earlier the indian academy of pediatrics is probably going to help us not only to continue training the private pediatricians but to take it on in the post graduate curriculum and so much for this congress for having given us this opportunity to share whatever we have been able to achieve i would like to acknowledge many of my colleagues who helped me with giving me information towards this presentation thank you very much for your patience with me And thank you to Mary Ann who would love to have been here today but unfortunately is un unable to do so and having been involved with the development in India since 2010 they have made huge strides but there is still a long way to go there are a lot of children in India needing palliative care but they have taught us about the training of communities and involving communities and so we come to our last speaker again on video who is Karen Bycroft and she's with the Starship Child Health um, in Auckland and the National Clinic Lead for Pediatric Palliative Care in New Zealand. Um so if we could have the New Zealand presentation please. Kia ora koto, ko Karen Bycroft Tokuingawa. No tamaki makaolo atero aho. Well, hello and greetings to you all from New Zealand. I'm Karen Bycroft. I work as a nurse practitioner at Starship Children's Hospital in Pediatric Palliative Care. Uh, I'm also the national clinical lead of the Pediatric Palliative Care Working Group. It's an absolute um privilege and an honor to have this opportunity to share with you some of what's happening in New Zealand. I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person. I would have desperately love to have been with you all uh however it wasn't to be it wasn't possible um so i'm really grateful to have this opportunity to share a little bit about what we're doing in new zealand aotearoa or new zealand is known as the land of the long white cloud and this really refers to the cloud formations which were across and around the country that helped the early polynesian navigators find the country and as i was thinking about the journey of pediatric palliative care it has been a process of uh, of of navigation and uncharted waters of where are we going where are we heading what's happening in pediatric palliative care um and how do we do that Uh and so today I'd just like to share a little bit about the services in New Zealand what is offered across the country 
some of the challenges in uh, service delivery and some of that relates to the geography, which has its own little unique challenges to this part of the world, um, or maybe not unique, so unique. Uh, the other challenges have been around work for paediatric palliative care that's been directed uh, by our Ministry of Health. However, the follow through from that has not occurred as we would have wished. Um, we have, despite all of that, um, had some achievements and continue to progress palliative care, and I'd love to share some of those with you. And, uh, and also just that this is an ongoing journey um, that we continue to, to explore. There is one specialist paediatric palliative care uh, service in New Zealand, and that's based at the top of the country. The service provides direct care to children and their families across the region, uh, including um, going to the three hospitals across the region. Uh, and we also go out and visit children in their homes and in their uh, community settings as well. Um, the service provides uh, nationwide uh, consultation where we provide support uh, to clinicians uh, who are providing the direct care uh, wherever children are in New Zealand. And often clinicians have not had experience in paediatric palliative care. It may be the only experience that they actually have. So providing a lot of support, um, not only in terms of symptom advice, but general support to them um, and the challenges of providing that care as well. And this is our team, the Starship Paediatric Palliative Care team. You may recognise some people in this photo. Um, some of you may well know uh, Dr. Ross Drake. Uh, he, uh, he, I'm sure he's known to many of you. Um, and uh, this photo was taken following one of our, possibly one of our favourite team activities is going to a local cafe for breakfast. Just something that we love to do every now and again to connect with each other. Uh, there are three other areas of New Zealand providing some level of paediatric palliative care and it's just wonderful that there is now a specialist in Wellington uh, and while she's working in adult hospice uh, she's making some great connections with the paediatric team uh, in Wellington and looking to develop a service there. Uh, there are other services providing uh, nursing support and counselling and therapy support uh, and I'd also just like to acknowledge Christchurch which um, covers a really vast area of the South Island. Um, and in terms of landmass, the South Island is considerably larger than the North. Uh, with mountains and challenging geography, the population is a lot more spread out and therefore it's more limited in terms of service and, and taking the service to where children and families are. A considerable piece of work was done in 2012 to advance paediatric palliative care in New Zealand. Uh, and this was directed by the Ministry of Health. And while this was done quite some time ago, uh, it still remains relevant and it still gives a, the guidance and the direction that for those that are working in paediatric palliative care, see where we should be moving towards and what we should continue to aim and advocate for. Uh, this becomes a continual challenge because while uh, this has been directed by our Ministry of Health, there has been no follow through with any of the recommendations being mandated or with the funding to support the progress uh, of the recommendations in this report as well. And I think it's important to share with you some of the challenge, ongoing challenges that we have in developing paediatric palliative care that have come out of this guiding document to develop these services in our country. Um, have included developing a 24-hour service to support clinicians nationally. Uh, another really important area has been um, the de has been de having dedicated coordinated positions, um, which we believe would enable a much more equitable approach to palliative care right across the country. Um, again, these have not been mandated and there has not been funding follow through to enable them to happen. So we continue to work um, towards educating health professionals and this is ongoing. Um, and we have established a national paediatric palliative care network. This has resulted in uh, pieces of work that has been useful to support um, these um, recommendations, but also to support the, pro the progress um, of paediatric palliative care too. And just to highlight a few th uh, areas that um, we have been working on in the National Reference Group 
has been the development of the clinical guidelines. Uh, these were developed a few years ago. They're currently going through their second review, um, which is the reason I wanted to highlight them. They continue to be available on the Starship website. Um, and it's really a process around ensuring there is um, there is rigor in the process used to ensure the evidence is, is as sound as possible. Um, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic and a lot of uncertainty in the early days of what this might mean, we wanted to contribute and, and contribute in a positive way. And so a subgroup was set up to establish some resources on grief and loss to support young people. These are available um, to clinicians and also available directly to families to utilise as well. Um, other areas that we've been involved in in the last few years is development of a consumer survey. Again, this is available to services to use uh, to, as a resource, um, as might be suitable um, uh, for, for their area and their region. Um, and education is ongoing. It is ongoing in every respect. And we run a monthly forum for paediatric palliative care nationwide. Uh, and we get a great uptake, uh, lots of interest. And uh, people around the country love hearing from the Starship team. So we all have to present fairly regularly. Uh, but I am encouraging case studies and um, discussions and um, people around the country to present their experiences as well. And so um, this is a lovely time of sharing together. Uh, there's some international research that you may be aware of. Uh, Ross leads the rapid research process um, from the New Zealand perspective um, and is very involved in that. Uh, another really important area is the transition program of adolescents and young adults to adult services. This is uh, an ongoing um, challenge as we support young people who may not have once survived childhood are now being transitioned into adult services where they have never cared for a young people, person with these conditions um, or with the significant needs that they have. Um, so there is a really clear guiding process for paediatrics and for adults and a working together process. And a, a couple of uh, my uh, colleagues on my team have been really involved in leading this and it's been very successful. Uh, and the other area I'd just like to mention um, that we have a commitment to te kanga requirements and that means that we have a commitment to working um, in partnership with the Indigenous people of New Zealand. This doesn't mean we don't work multiculturally because we do and we certainly try to, but we also believe the importance of working very closely with, um, with the Indigenous, pe Indigenous people, the Māori uh, people of New Zealand. I would like to now finish with a Māori karakia. Um, these are often used to open and close meetings and we are now using these more routinely in working with um, families, um, children and families. Often when we have a family meeting, we will offer a family a karakia or a prayer or whatever they would like to do to um, open a meeting and if they'd like to close a meeting as well. Sometimes they like to lead it, sometimes they want us to lead it. Um, and so I will um, read this to you in Māori, in Te Reo, uh, and you can read along um, in English. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa po namu te moana, hei huarahi mā tato i te rangi nei, araha atu, araha mai, tato i a tato katoa, huie tākie. Thank you so much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to share a little bit of what's happening in New Zealand with you all. I wish you all well. Go well. Ka kite. Let me compliment the speakers because to condense in 10 minutes a task that uh, was given to you really looked to me impossible. And in fact, uh, when uh, I asked uh, Joan, uh, but really it's possible in 10 minutes to condense uh, the characteristics of uh, an area of the world. Uh, we live today in this uh, magic world, uh, globalization. And I think we have a false idea of globalization. I think Every part of the world, somebody has something like this, even in the poorest country. You find a McDonald's and a bottle of Coca-Cola anywhere in the world. 
transportation certainly is facilitated, but uh, global aviation in the real sense of the word is not real. We live in a very fragmented world. And uh, I was surprised when uh, I saw the titles of the presentation, Middle East, Europe, but like coming from an area of the world would be a homogeneous experience. It is not. Uh, even in Europe, the experience in pediatric palliative care in the United Kingdom are very different from those in Italy. I would have even a difficulty in describing palliative care for children in Italy with the difference between North and South, and certainly there are differences between Germany and Sweden and so on. And uh, so I think it was an illusion. Each one, of course, gave his own experience in his own country. Well, so we have, I think today, we had a distorted picture of, the, of what really happens in the world concerning pediatric palliative care. Because most of the presentations were given by people, by speakers, who had, a, 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 I think, an outstanding experience, who represent uh, really uh, institutions or organizations that are not distributed in the same way. They are the top. And uh, I really think that uh, uh, the illusion that pediatric palliative care can be distributed uniformly, not globally, uniformly in every country, in countries where really they have to face the problem not about quality of life, but <laughs> survival, <laughs> duration of life, and not palliative care, but simply access to care, health care, and uh, no education, and so on. I think this is the major handicap, the major uh, barrier for the equal distribution of uh, uh, pediatric palliative care around the world. I don't know what we can do. Uh, most of us really live in countries that this uh, way of care is, is well developed. But I think that we have to think about this. I think that uh, maybe if the Maruza organizes another Congress within the next two years, one should be one of the themes uh, of our presentation. How can we really help this kind of barrier, which is, I think, the most important one that we are facing now? Thank you for coming to Rome and uh, welcome to your way back to the country. Bye.